Um, hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Monotype, for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be able to offer here um, another kind of perspective, not a technical one, but more uh, a design slash business one on, the, on this new phone format. So um, maybe some words of introduction first. Um, most of the ideas that uh, I would suggest in this presentation come from either discussions that I had or discussions that I observed from um, giants on shoulders of which I am currently sitting. Um, people like Eric van Berkland, David Berlow, Bram Stein, Nick Sherman, Stephen Coles, Indra Kupferschmidt, John Hudson and Kai Bernau. Uh, so these are also the, the people who are actually presenting with me here today. Um, some words of context first. Um, are found variations here already? Um, well, not quite. Uh, it's not there, so that's, we still have some lead time before uh, actually this hits the market. Um, and this initiative right now, what this event, is exactly what we should uh, get the most of, trying to find new ideas, trying to find um, solutions and standards on which to, to harmonize. Um, are softwares ready yet? And by that I mean different, many different kinds of softwares. Well, um, of course they are not ready yet. Not at the OS level, the operating systems. Um, not in the end user apps, definitely not. Um, I mean, look at how long it took for Photoshop to get, have a Glyphs palette. Um, softwares, type design softwares are more or less ready. Uh, we've seen that all, all day yesterday, and I believe we'll continue to see that today and tomorrow. Um, maybe slightly more important, are clients ready yet? I'm not even sure clients are ready now for open type standardly, so about uh, variable fonts. Um, well, what what have we learned from OpenType uh, standard, OpenType static, OpenType, um, is that probably it, this new standard won't catch up, won't, won't take in if the users can directly benefit from it. But I'll talk about it more later. And furthermore, are we all ready yet? Well, I don't feel ready. Do you feel ready? No. So bottom line is, should we worry? Should we worry that we're not ready, that nothing's ready, that not, no softwares are ready? I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my time today and in the, the adoption of this new format. It's a bit of a watch and learn thing. Um, this conference is a very technical one and I believe that everyone here in this room is here because he or she is interested in uh, technique, so uh, maybe the bottom line, of, one of the bottom lines of this presentation is uh, don't oversweat the technique. Um, many of us would say, um, kind of in an up nosy way, oh, I'm an artist, I don't, I don't deal with technique. Well, um, type designers are not artists. We're not artists. Are we scientists? Um, I heard um, Jürgen. Uh, guest on uh, yesterday uh, talk about um, type designers as scientists. Wow, uh, that's a big word. I don't really feel like a scientist um, in any way whatsoever. I use science, any kind of science, human science, history, technology, uh, but my work is not scientific at all. Uh, are we researchers? Uh, we hear the word research every five minutes in this business. And it's sort of annoying because I don't, I don't think I, am, I have the soul of a researcher. It's maybe mixed with the concept of exploration. Um, I do a lot of explorations. I open a lot of books, I do a lot of sketchings, but when I do, am I a researcher? No, I'm an explorer. I'm trying to make, come up with um, not necessarily new, but at least different shapes, different designs. Um, the crowd that I feel we are maybe most connected to is industrial designers, if you think about it. Much, much more than uh, graphic designers, in a sense. 
Um, industrial designers deal with technique at a very highly skilled level. Uh, they deal with highly reproducible works of design, such as we do. When a book is typeset, it's, it's using thousands of copies of the exact same uh, instance of a letter shape. Um, industrial designers deal with prototypes, partial prototypes. They deal with uh, production in mass uh, series. Um, and they care deeply about the comfort of the people who will actually be using their products. Um, so this is my gut feeling, that we are much, much closer to industrial designers. But of course, we are none of the above. We are just simply type designers. Um, so what does a type designer do? Uh, do, we, do we just solve problems? That's also something we hear a lot. Your job is to solve problems. Wow, that's super sad, in a sense. That's just like what's written here. It's probably the lowest form of, de of design, solving problems. I can think of anything sadder. Hey, uh, I have this issue, can you help me? Yeah, okay, no problem. That's not what it's all about. It's not about um, what you do, it's mostly about how you do it and the way people come to you to find your opinion, your view on a specific problem. That's what type design is about. Uh, so this, this sentence, this quotation is not from me, it's from Matthew Butterick. Um, and I believe this is uh, something that was most inspiring when trying to come up with uh, client briefs, commissions, dealing with retail typefaces. Um, solving problems is really the least question you need to worry about. Um, so, well, let's get into it, uh, the design part, the design perspective. Um, why would variable fronts be interesting to us? Um, well, first, it's a lot of fun to play with. Well, you've seen the previous lecture. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of exploration to be done, and this is currently the only thing that's actually happening. There is no um, actual work that, it, that is being put out and as a proof of the usefulness, the big serious questions of usefulness. Why are we doing things? Is it just decoration? Well, th there's nothing wrong about decoration, but are we decorators? Are we just jokers, clowns for the audience? Hey, look, this font has bubbles and it moves and it can do this and this and this, like uh, an orchestra man or circus artist. Proof, proof of concept are fine, they are inspiring, they drive us forward, um, but that's about it. Uh, so maybe the, the whole question about what is it for, what can I do with it, what can my clients do with it, is something we should actually worry much more about. What we can do as designers with variable fonts. Hooray! We got, we got over 64K axes. Great. Uh, meanwhile, we're still waiting for the 21st stylistic set <laughs> to put things in sharp perspective. Um, I'm also waiting for the 32nd character in my font naming habits because I really, really, really would like to have my own Jensen revival, extra bold, condensed, caption, italic. Small caps. In, in my font menu, this is also something I'd like to have and since I began my career uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but none of this is going to happen soon, apparently. So 20 stylistic set, awesome. I have ideas for 64,000 axes, so I prepared the list. Um, 100 per slide, approximately. Uh, no, seriously, um, maybe the most obvious things that we can design uh, in, in, a, in variable fonts are legacy multiple master things that were already uh, laid, laid down. Uh, so we can work with width, obviously, uh, weight, optical size. Uh, serifs is an interesting thing. Uh, the shape of serifs, of serifs, their length, their bracketedness. Um, let's play around with X height. That's also pretty useful. Uh, that's a nice way to build hierarchy and variation in a, in a design job. 
Uh, of course, if you play with X8, you have to play with the length of extenders. Uh, we just saw, ten, five, five, ten minutes ago, the opening of aperture, the angle of terminals, uh, the contrast amount, of course, and the contrast axis, which can go from upright, from oblique, to straight, to even reverse contrast. Um, and also a very interesting thing is grades from light to dark, whether it's backlit or uh, whether it's a positive or negative background, things like that. Um, let's dig a bit further down. Um, we can also work with angle and slant. That's uh, also a nice thing to, to play around with. Um, we'll see more about that with italics. Um, the depth and size of ink traps or light traps, uh, which can be linked to, the, uh, to backlit negative versions of your typefaces. Uh, corner roundness is a, is a fun thing, uh, very interesting, because it actually changes the mood, the voice of the typeface quite a lot. And by uh, the amount of roundness, we also need to deal with the, um, the squareness of these round shapes, the uh, O that goes from round to square. And it goes on and on. Small caps height, um, automatic generation of glyphs, that's super interesting. I mean, we all already use interpolation more or less to draw in superiors and inferiors, unless you're really, really hardcore about it. No, someone did that. And uh, let's also think about a per glyph axis, where it would um, maybe compete with open type features in, alt in the uh, happening of alternates. So maybe in the end we have this 64,000 stylistic set thing that we were dreaming of. Um, on the more expressive side, we have uh, much higher, much bigger changes of mood in a typeface with uh, distress, distressedness, water, um, expressiveness and bounce. Uh, so that uh, where the, the, the fun kids part, toy, thing, uh, chimes in. Uh, in Axis Praxis, I saw a typeface that had cookies axis, fringe, hoof, concavity. I mean, who is going to actually need that? But it's fun to play with. And then uh, roughness, darkness, all the texture kind of thing um, for grunge fonts. Um, let the 90s come back. Um, oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then something that was um, curiously n n not discussed uh, already here, but maybe, maybe later, um, color fonts. Uh, do we have a color axis? Do we need a color axis? Um, what can you explore with, um, with color in a, in a variable fonts? And then the fun part, animation. I mean, just like the slides animation, there's a designer behind those animations. Um, just like the, the, the GIFs that we saw from um, Just yesterday. Um, what's next? Script fonts, of course. Um, they can directly benefit from variable fonts. You can work with angle, while the slant, you can, have, uh, you can combine it with uh, extending ascenders and descenders. Um, the length of connecting strokes is an interesting thing to, th to think about, especially for connected scripts, of course. And a tracking axis. Who has never cringed at a slightly tracked script font? And then, specifically for script fonts, um, the amount of swashiness, and very important, never underestimate the importance of the size of the balls. Um, something that I really think um, would be useful for the kind of clients that I deal with um, is everything that has to deal with um, horizontal and vertical spacing and calibration. So a spacing axis was uh, pretty much instantly proposed, uh, just, uh, I mean, only a few weeks or a few months after the, the, the format was announced. Um, the kerning axis is very interesting as well because in the same um, file, you could, for instance, have uh, a, a tight but not touching axis kind of thing, where the letters would be super tight and at the opposite, uh, regular spacing. Um, if you deal with uh, newspapers or 
clients that print in, or display in a display text in very different environments. Uh, the multiplexing of weights is interesting as well, so you can work with grades and resolutions and have uh, everything be uh, in sync and harmonized. Uh, dynamic things like make the headline text fit the given column width. Um, also very interesting for typographers, uh, the work on hyphenation and justification. Um, we are all used to the, this style sheet um, interface with minimum, optimal, and maximum percentages of uh, tracking. And uh, if it's all within the fonts, then we can just uh, decide if uh, just uh, full justified um, also affects the shape of the glyphs in a way that the designer actually uh, con can control it. Uh, and the same for line breaks. If I had to fit a given text within a line uh, without it to break at a, in a bad position, uh, then uh, variable fonts can be uh, uh, at the rescue. Also, uh, bolds. There's been quite a few mention of bolds here already. Contextual bold. Bold is, is always in reference to something. It's bolder than, or it's used as a different mean of differenti differentiation. Um, so if you increase the weight of the regular because that's how you like your grade to be, then the bold needs to change. Um, and the rest of the weights as well. Uh, responsiveness, dynamicness, dynamicity. Um, we can now have fonts, we can hope that we'll have fonts that respond to um, device resolution, uh, have something, maybe uh, outlines that go from coarse to fine. Um, we can also work with device rendering, uh, hopefully if the fonts detect their environment, uh, and device screen proportions. The obvious thing where you rotate your screen and the typeface goes from slightly narrow to slightly expanded. The work on background color or background images uh, is a nice thing um, to work with. Um, just like ambient light conditions, time of the day. I had a student once who was working on a typeface form to announce the weather depending on the, if it was cloudy or sunny. Uh, this is something I guess ca car UI designers will be uh, interested in. Um, much, much more population oriented uh, age responsiveness of design for not only the elderly, but the kids, the person with visual deficiencies, reading deficiencies. Um, typefaces can help to a certain extent uh, on that and many other applications such as map, augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure it's never ending, but it's a big enough list. Um, so maybe the thing we need to worry about as designers is the amount of complexity, because of course, at some point, we'll end up with a big plate of spaghettis and trying to put some, make some sense out of it. And slightly, the, those variable fonts will sweep from being just variable to uh, parametric, where uh, it's actually distortable in any possible ways. I don't really want to have to deal with that as a designer. It's just overwhelming. And even with a whole team behind me, um, that's way beyond uh, a point of focus, an acceptable point of focus. So there's going to be, at some point, I believe, a, um, a threshold of acceptability and complexity. This is actually a um, picture taken from a parametric system, not a variable font system, but a system that uses a template uh, called Prototypo. Um, another big serious question that uh, we need to worry about is uh, UI. How do we want to give users access to it? Is this uh, the way we want to, uh, our typefaces to be presented? I mean, isn't it complicated enough already? If you want to access stylistic sets right now, if, if you have the conscious that stylistic set exists, this is the kind of thing you have to deal with. Uh, is this really the interface we want to give <laughs> to the users? That's, that's not how I want to 
treat the people who are um, kind enough to buy our font. So uh, this is probably something that power users, uh, tech engineers, web designers to some extent, um, can deal with, but the end user doesn't need to and doesn't want to see this kind of crap. So we can maybe have a sh very, very short uh, technical part. Uh, do I need to worry about tech as a designer? Uh, well, I'd like to have more time for design, and this is actually what my main point of focus is. I'm super thankful that super talented, highly skilled uh, technicians, engineers, uh, um, thinkers are um, taking a great care of making the technique ready for me as a designer. Uh, but I don't want to spend more time tweaking font names, tweaking stems, hinting stems, or um, even preparing uh, kerning groups. I want to spend more time actually drawing because that's where all the value of a design is. It's not about whether your font passes any, a certain kind of QA. Um, what we still need to worry a little bit about is that we have to prepare for a new standard. Yes, again. Um, I'm kind of young, to, to a certain uh, point of view, uh, so I'm, which means I'm, I was lucky enough to uh, open up my own uh, shop uh, with only one font format uh, available, which is OpenType. Uh, I worked a bit with PostScript fonts uh, when I was younger, but I did not, certainly did not have to prepare a lot of Mac TrueType Greek fonts, things like that recalls a few nightmare memories. Um, so, yeah, there's a new standard. Is it going to wipe out all the old things? I don't believe so. Um, standard static open type fonts are uh, going to be here for a while uh, uh, still, just like um, low resolution displays. We've been promised uh, retina screens everywhere for the past, I don't know, five, ten years. Um, I'm still, I'm waiting. Uh, so, yeah, we need to, to prepare our um, work processes, our um, purchase and buying processes for this new standard. Um, I feel like I can do it, but uh, to be honest, I've never done it, so, because I lack experience and this new... But I think there will be a new standard again in a few years and so on and so on. But, so this is something, as a designer, we need to keep up with. Um, what does it mean? Actually, this means building documentation. How user-friendly do you want to be? Uh, do you want to spend your time uh, advocating or evangelizing for this new standard? Um, write nice documentation that maybe some uh, IT uh, guy will read, maybe. Uh, lots of client support, which is step two. Uh, yes, yes, this, it installs, it validates, but I only see one instance, what's happening? And I can't um, new font formats mean new, uh, an increased amount of products on your shelves, so SKU, single key units, so you need to tidy up your room and make uh, space for this uh, a new amount of files that is going to, uh, to populate your, your shelves. Um, how, as a, as a font seller, you're going to deal with tryouts? What do you want clients to try? Is it really, really the, the dynamicness, the flexibility of the fonts? I mean, they can see that everywhere already. Um, how do you manufacture tryout fonts? Of course, there's font naming and packaging involved. Um, I see it from a designer perspective, um, not from a technical one. Uh, how simply can we come up with um, a harmonized name? I always hated the OpenType Pro thing, as if the rest was OpenType Amateur or something. Static and variable is not bad. We'll see how we can shorten it to OTV, or OT static, OTS. OTS exists already, I think. Anyway, and of course, the big question of font pricing and licensing, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in a separate part. Um, there's also the big question of your font store UI. How are you going practically, visibly, to sell these kind of fonts? Um, first of all, what kind of clients do you have? 
Uh, are your clients power users? I mean, for instance, my own foundry is pretty niche, and which means that people who know about our existence are already somehow knowledgeable in typography in a general sense. Doesn't mean at all that they are power users. Not at all. I still get questions about small caps and the inclusion of uh, hanging figures in the fonts. So um, don't rely too much on the client's knowledge. It should be simple, fast, fun, straightforward to purchase uh, variable fonts. And not, uh, hey, here's the simple 10 steps process in acquiring a variable font. Um, also, how big is your love for sliders as a, as a merchant? Um, as much as I hate sliders, um, I'm not sure I can really avoid them, so we'll see. It's all about we'll see. Um, and then phone QA, uh, how do you deal with, um, if, uh, how would you deal with the technical quality of your phones if you are selling instances? Um, I read that one of the future trends um, globally is personalization, customization. If you um, look closer to the state of the general retail market, uh, not only type design, it's rather true. Uh, you can buy cars and you get to pick the color of the roof and you can uh, put your initials on bags and you can have uh, nice little sneakers with I love sneakers written on it if you want it. Um, so it was only a matter of time before it arrives to fonts and um, if all is customizable, do you want your clients to be able to customize their font names? Is it something useful? Do, will we get requests for that? Just like, will we get ever requests for color fonts? Someone did get requests for color fonts? Raise your hand. Anyway, uh, so yeah, finally, there it is, uh, the business part. Um, why are we having Variable fonts. Well, I think the big truth is that's why we're having variable fonts. It's because it reduces the amount of files you need to deal with as an IT engineer, and it reduces the file size that you need to deal with as an IT engineer. Where's the design part? It's not really there. It's variable fonts are useful for the people who came up with the format. Design is just a gift wrap. You say, hey, make variable fonts. It's fun. You'll love it. <laughs> do we benefit as designers from this? Yes, of course, a little bit. Do our clients do, will benefit from this? Yes, of course, a tiny bit. But it's mostly a matter of tech and industry. So don't, it's, it's a fool's game, if you believe it's only for the love of design. Also, another truth that I've found during uh, my, 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 my practice is that fonts that need a manual to work never will catch up, never will work. Uh, if you have to ship a PDF explaining, hey, my layer fonts does this and this and this, and you need to activate this because it's not standard, and if it doesn't work out of the box, it just doesn't work at all. Um, clients want to download a file, install it, start typing. If you put anything in between those processes, you're just slowing down things, you're getting in the way. And that's my biggest fear with variable fonts, is that we are, taught, we are told that we should try to insert variability uh, in our um, business processes. And this is just making us lose time. What we want to sell is design. We, we don't sell tools. We sell design to customers, to graphic designers who use our design in their own. And also maybe um, um, an observation, open type features did not really catch on. I mean, let's not be fooled here. Uh, uh, foundries are uh, separating back again small caps from their standard fonts and make two different fonts of them, uh, Akim and um, the, the Underway guys are doing that. And it's uh, actually uh, um, just observing what's the reality of the market is. Um, hanging figures, superiors, inferiors, small caps, this is all the kind of thing that the client only ever discover from time to time, but it's not what we get requests for. We get requests for 
good design, and that's about it. So my two cents about uh, the arrival of variable fonts is that in the end I would just cut down to uh, making smaller and smaller character sets and going straight to what's useful. AZ, AZ, 09, punctuation, some accent, that's it. I would, don't want to bother anymore putting a lot of ornaments, alternates, stuff that I have fun designing but nobody will ever use. So this is, don't see variable fonts as more work for the type designer. If you just step aside and avoid the whole, you have to know that part. Um, it just gives you more time to design, really. And then pricing. So. Um, in Gutenberg times, in uh, around 1470, um, font typeface cutting, uh, punching, matrices justifying, and everything, all this work was considered state-of-the-art technology. And it was. Um, people were spying on each other, trying to bring back the technology from one country to another. If you wanted to buy a one-size typeface, of, say, a very beautiful Canon by Grandjean. Um, the whole case would cost about the price for a small house. That's not, that wasn't that uncommon. From then on, prices went down. <laughs> um, uh, about five centuries later, we had the good old days of uh, photo lettering and photo typesetting. Who, who, who was professionally active in the business of phototype setting. Yeah. So you remember the, the days where we could price per letter a typesetting. It was about 300 francs, uh, 45 euros to typeset uh, a word. If you wanted to add a contour around the typeface, that would cost extra. And so on. Um, so these guys just had to bend and get the money. And then there's current practices. Um, well, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna uh, rant about current pricing practices. Let's just observe. Uh, single styles are priced between uh, around fifty dollars uh, a single, uh, a single font file um, or a single style. And there is a, a threshold with full font families at around three hundred dollars. Um, Above that price, uh, clients are hesitating uh, to make uh, the, the purchase of a whole family. How will variable fonts affect that? Well, I'm not sure that single display styles will be affected. I mean, if you manufacture a single display font, it's, it's just like um, having a wardrobe and you need um, things for the everyday and things for big occasions. Uh, uh, you need a little cocktail dress, very flashy, but you'll use it only once. So I have a few cocktail dresses. Uh, <laughs> you, need, you need also t-shirts just for the seasons that will be very cheap. You'll use them only once. And you, actually, you can't use them more than once because you wash them, there's holes, and it's suddenly very narrow and everything. And then you have designer stuff. Uh, the quality stuff, the things you just you put on selected occasions, or very like jeans, for instance, blue jeans, uh, things that you will wear on a daily basis over and over until you get tired of it, or until it worns out in a sense. Well, digital data never worns out. Single display styles are not necessarily affected unless you 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 work on a you think it's worth working on a on a super complicated variable display font, think about it for a second. You spend a year designing it, and it's used for a tea packaging. Do you think that there is a, a correspondence between the amount of work that you will put in the display and the actual use? It's, uh, it's the same thing with um, what happens in font stand, for instance. Font stand is great for many, many things, but it's not great at licensing display styles because you only use it once, and that's it. So you won't actually rent a typeface for three euros and use it once. Um, 
how are we going to price uh, custom instances? We'll see. Uh, should it be the same price as a single phone file? Should it be more? Should it be less? I don't know. It's a bit more work to prepare the instance, but it's much less work to maintain, to assist, to, to actually do the post-sales support. What do you do? Uh, how do you do um, the post-sales support of something that is highly customized just for one user? Um, will we price single accesses? Oh, we have a 64K font, a uh, font with 64K axes. And, uh, but this is a price for a single, price for a single axis, price for two axes. How do you upgrade? And then the price for uh, a full open type variable font. Uh, see, I'm using OTVAR. Let's, let's see, maybe OTV, so whatever. Um, what's the price for a full open type variable font? Is it, uh, the, does it equal the price of a family? That's a good start, but you have more than just a family. Uh, will we package preset instances in an OT variable uh, font file? And there's no variability, no current variability between those instances. Um, how do you tell the users there's no variability in an open type variable font? Um, my, my, I think that just like before, um, there's going to be yet another price drop in the font pricing habits. Um, and uh, it will begin the very minute where some, one of our esteemed colleagues will price a full variable font family the price of, an actual, uh, of a static font family. Digital fonts uh, stay, stick around for quite a while. Uh, you can actually still use uh, your PostScript fonts from the 90s. Don't. Um, we've managed to make users pay for those pro open type versions of old digital data. Uh, old digital data. Um, do you think they will accept to be charged for upgrades again? Well, maybe the clients of Microsoft, Adobe, Google, yes, because they will see an interest in gaining maybe, I don't know, $200,000 uh, worth of bandwidth uh, a year. But my retail users, my graphic designers, the, the guys who do the, the cutting edge work, if they have something that works out of the box with OpenType, why would they use uh, a new format that seems to be more complicated? Um, so, yes, font variations will probably lead to a price drop. We'd better, uh, we'd better prepare for that. And even much more than a price drop, we can, with much certainty, ex uh, expect a dumping of prices. I mean, we've all seen those 90% discounts. Uh, don't think they will stop at the, at the door of static open type. Uh, so, hey, we have this six in Axis family uh, for only $15. Uh, how do you compete with that as an independent foundry or as, as an independent designer? Well, have an ID, and that's uh, how I'm going to uh, conclude here. Uh, the ID is to focus on uh, quality, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and that's, that should be our only concern as designers. If your design is good enough, be sure that it will sell. It doesn't matter how it, it's packaged. That's what clients buy. They don't buy it for the cleanliness of your open type features. They don't buy it for the, uh, for the fancy way you name them. They buy for the, what they see, and what, if they see is quality, that's, um, that's, what will, uh, that's, that's how they will buy it. So uh, thank you. Keep thinking about it.